Rena Striegel. Welcome to Ag Inspo, the podcast that focuses on innovation and creativity in agriculture. In my travels across the U.S., my mind is blown by the farmers, ranchers, and business owners who are contributing to the richness of the agricultural landscape. My hope is that by sharing their stories, you will be inspired to have the courage to break through and bring an idea you have to life. Hi, everybody. I am so excited today. I'm going to be talking to Shelby Smith. She is the owner of Jim and Eats Crickets. And she is an amazing young woman who has gone from a career overseas to coming back home to Iowa and starting a business that is driven 100% by cricket consumption. So I know you're going to be intrigued about how she got into this line of work and how she has gone from knowing nothing about crickets to having a very thriving and growing business. So with that, let's bring on Shelby and welcome to the Ag Inspo podcast. So Shelby, I am so excited to have you on the Ag Inspo podcast. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to just chat with me a little bit and share a little bit about your story and what you're up to. And rather than me try to explain it, I would love if you could just tell our listeners you know, a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your business and kind of how you got into this, because it is so interesting, you know, in terms of, you know, innovation in agriculture. When I heard about your story, I thought, now that is some serious innovation and not something that we're going to run to on every street corner in America, at least until you put your product there. But tell, tell the listeners a little bit about, about you and your company. Of course. Well, first off, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I love, love to get the opportunity to tell my story. Um, so believe it or not, you know, growing up, I wanted nothing to do with egg, despite being a farmer's daughter. So I grew up on a row crop operation, about 2000 acres northeast of Ames. And like I said, wanted nothing to do with agriculture. Uh, I have an older brother who is four years older than me. He's an F-16 pilot in the Air Force. So he was all about egg, you know, driving the tractors from five years old, you know, would ride with my dad all the time, really enjoyed it. My mom and dad always tell the story that my mom would drop me off to ride in the combine or ride in the tractor with my dad. And about 10 minutes later, she'd get a call for, from him to come pick me up because I'd just be climbing up the walls. I just didn't have interest. <laughs> Um, but, you know, that that level of activity, that level of athleticism, I suppose, ended up paying off because I ended up earning a scholarship to play basketball in college at a Division One university, St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. So I was on a one-way ticket out of Iowa as well in high school. I, I never wanted to stay here, didn't want to stay in the Midwest. So I went out to Philadelphia played basketball out there, got my undergraduate degree in finance, double majored in finance and financial planning. I'm about one class short on that financial planning. It was a tax course. So it's that time of year right now. Everyone probably understands why I dropped that class second (laughs) semester senior year. Um, And then after that, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. But I got an opportunity to go over to Ireland with a program called Sport Changes Life. So it takes former college athletes and brings them over to Ireland. And then it's a three-part program. So it's part education. So I have a master's degree from Trinity College in Dublin in finance. Um, It's part, you know, continuing your playing career. So I played in the Irish National Professional League and then, and also for Trinity on their college team, which was more like a club team, but still worked out. And then the third part is the service part. So we coach in underprivileged areas. So hoping to bring the value of the values of sport to these underprivileged areas to hopefully foster some opportunity and some confidence in these kids. So that was back in graduated college in 2013, master's degree in 2014. I was only supposed to be in Ireland for one year, but I ended up falling in love with my team you know, the people just, I wasn't ready to, to come back to the U.S. and I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I had this brand new master's degree in finance and I said, you know what, I probably should use it. And so went on the job search and got an email from the head of our finance department at Trinity College. And he said, you know, there's this new trading desk that's looking to interview people from your class. Are you interested? I said, sure, put me in contact, walked into that interview 
And uh, they said, hi, do you know what we do? And I said, no idea. They said, okay, perfect. You're hired. And uh, (laughs) so it was the National Bank of Canada and they had just opened a brand new trading desk as their European hub in Ireland. And they brought me on originally as a risk intern. And when I came in, I was the seventh employee and we had about $30 million in trades on the book, which sounds like a lot, but it's really tiny in the trading world. Fast forward six months and they had moved me to trading. So I was trading equity derivatives then at that point. And then um, about three years later, when I had figured out that I was really not into the whole finance thing, definitely not into the trading thing, didn't want to be that when I grew up. But uh, by the time I left, we had just hired our 30th employee and had over 10 and a half billion on the balance sheet. So we went through a lot of growth in a very small amount of time. And I always say that, you know, cutting my teeth that way was very valuable, um, but it just wasn't something I wanted to do. I really wasn't satisfied doing it. Uh, You know, I wasn't one of those that was going through college with a finance degree with the dreams of working on Wall Street or anything equivalent. Uh, It was just an opportunity that fell in my lap. So I ran with it. But, you know, it started to get to a point where I was needing to make a decision of whether I continued down that path and then, you know, looked elsewhere. Like, did I move to London? Did I move to New York? Uh, Neither of those really appealed either. You know, I grew up on a farm. New York and London are about the two furthest things from that. So I, I, I quit <laughs> and I said, I don't have a plan. And my parents were like, well, you can come back and, and farm with us. You know, stuff that I had no interest <laughs> in growing up. But I was like, sure, it seems better than, you know, what I was doing. It can't be any worse than what I was doing. It can't be any more miserable than, than I was doing what I was doing. So I'll come back. So I got back. October of 17, uh, on October 1st. So just in time for harvest, learned how to drive the tractor day one, got thrown in the grain cart day two, had some mishaps here and there, but everybody ended up alive and with all five, (laughs) all 10 fingers and toes. So we were fine. Um, so made it through that harvest. And then, you know, at that point, my dad and I started having conversations about what were we going to do moving forward? You know, did I want to stay on and learn this and, you know, eventually start taking things over as he retires, as if he's ever going to retire. He's like right. any other farmer. Um, they'll work, you know, work until they can't. Yeah. Uh, so we started having those conversations and uh, honestly, the, the spark for the conversation about going into more of a niche was a gift basket that we got at Christmas full of maple syrup of all things. You know, it was a farm, a small farm that produced maple syrup and had this whole basket and everything. And he pointed at it and he said, that's something, that's what you should look at. You need to do something that's niche. So you don't have to fight these same markets that I've fought for over 30 years. You know, there's lots of different things you could do. And so this would have been, you know, December of 2017. Um, So fast forward just a couple of weeks, uh, January 1st of 2018, I sent both of my parents an article about a woman raising crickets for human consumption. And I said, hey, I think I can do that. And, you know, to their credit, they didn't say no. (laughs) You know, they didn't even hesitate. They just kind of said, well, you know, we've heard weirder things go. So do some more research and, and, you know, let us know what you come up with. And, um, you know, I did a little research, talked to a few people, didn't really get satisfactory answers. So I decided my best way of researching was to buy 10,000 crickets. So 10 days later, I bought 10,000 crickets. Before I'd ever even tried to eat a cricket, I had live crickets show up on the doorstep. So call it a leap of faith, I suppose. Um, And then at that point, you know, I really had to figure out how I was going to sell these crickets. So originally that article that I had read and and any article that I had had seen on the entomophagy, which is the eating of insects market, said that there just wasn't enough supply of these crickets raised for human consumption. So that was where my initial uh, light bulb went off was, oh, here's an opportunity, supply and demand opportunity. You know, I can grow them and I can sell them to these companies that already exist, but I couldn't get any of them to have any serious conversation with me or definitive enough conversation that I would be comfortable scaling that business without their backing, I suppose. And so eventually I just said, forget you guys, I will 
I'll just come up with my own products. Like I'm a pretty good cook, I feel like. So I think I can do that. And so at that point, then I then had to figure out, you know, what does it take to be a food business? Like how, what licensing do I need? Where am I allowed to sell? Like all of these different things. Um, and initially the, the fastest, easiest, cheapest way to get in front of a lot of people with the lowest risk would be farmer's markets. So that's what I applied for the Ames Main Street Farmer's Market here in Ames, which is kind of small, like it's not, it's growing, um, but it's nothing like the Des Moines Downtown Farmer's Market. And, and applied to that and the director emailed me back and said, that's pretty weird, but you're in, like, well, we're excited to have you. So at that point, I had until from January until May to figure out how to raise crickets, figure out how to cook with crickets, make them taste good, like packaging, all of that stuff. And, um, you know, sitting here would be almost, you know, two years, a little over two years from that time. Now, I just look back, like, the people who bought my crickets originally, I just almost want to go back and apologize to them. Like, I, they were in Ziploc bags, like, oh, gosh. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things if I just sit and look back, I go, oh, man, it's it's a wonder anybody bought any of those. But... I ended up in 2018, so that first year, selling out of every single cricket I raised in the middle of central Iowa, full of meat and potatoes people that weren't going to like crickets, is what everybody told me. Yeah. Um, so what were so, your original products? So you have them in Ziploc bags, but what are you selling? Are you selling roasted crickets? Are you selling, like, talk a little bit about your initial products. So my initial products were roasted crickets, and then I call them protein bites. So they'd be like those energy bites that you can get at some grocery stores and things like that. They were really, the bites were really inconvenient to buy and, and package and hold on to and all of that. It took me a couple months to figure out that, oh, there's a reason you put a protein bar in a bar form. It just makes it easier to package and store and all of that kind of stuff. So those were my two originals. I would mess around a little bit with cricket powder, but because I didn't know what I was doing on the cricket rearing side I didn't have a whole lot of crickets to mess with and the powder the margins just weren't as good so I most of the time was not selling that and at any time that I had it I would sell out of it very quickly because people were very interested in it so yeah it was the roasted crickets and I want to say I started with four flavors but I can't remember I'd have to go back and look at old pictures I'm pretty sure I started with four flavors the protein bites my goodness there were some weeks I would have like up to 12 flavors I was just it, but it you know it's a it's a again it's a low risk the farmers market is a low risk way to get a lot of direct customer feedback right away mm -hmm. uh, so that I used it for all it was worth on that one it's a it's a great tool in terms of food marketing to be able to test out products in a very low low risk sort of way I guess yeah um so yeah those were those were my first products but yeah <laughs> so so just talk a little bit about getting set up so these 10,000 crickets show up in a box I'm assuming or some sort of container and then you have to have a place to raise them so where did you put your first livestock <laughs> right um so good question uh do you have any concept of like what a two week old cricket looks like size wise no. or anything? I, I'm assuming maybe pretty tiny or maybe not. Yeah. See, I had no, con it, yep. I had no concept either. Um, but I found out really fast and the box that they came in, so they came in a box, there were 5,000 in each box and it was very well taped up and everything. There was a reason for that because they're so tiny. As soon as you cut the tape, they're everywhere. So I always, I always joke that you know I bought ten thousand, but I maybe got six thousand in their houses where they were supposed to be. The rest of them, they just became free range. And then of that first breeding stock, I got maybe a thousand to the end. I just didn't know what I was doing. Location-wise, where I started, you have to keep crickets warm, so it needed to be a well-insulated space. And um, my dad had a break room in his shop that had been double insulated for noise, because you know if you're working in the shop and you need to to go and take a call or something, you just step into step into break room and perfect, you can hear. Made great home for crickets, so his break room became my first cricket rearing room. 
And so I started with two 18 gallon storage bins that I bought on sale in Tyson's because it was January and you know that's organizing time. So all those storage bins are on sale at that point. I bought a wire rack from Sam's Club, set that up, put my two bins on there, and then fast forward about six months and I had 10 of those racks smashed in there with about 80 bins. Um, so things expanded pretty quickly. But that was my first cricket rearing space. And then he also conveniently had an office that was upstairs that was tiny. It was like a little closet, but it was also double insulated for noise. And so that became when I grew out of that initial space. And as I couldn't keep up with demand, he sacrificed that office to me. Oh, as a, so, yeah. So good dad. Yeah, no, he's great. <laughs> he's great. You know, uh, I could not have started this without my parents. I, I started raising them in the break room of my dad's shop and then eventually the office and then uh, started cooking them in my mother's kitchen. So, you know, they both love me very much and uh, put up with all the trials and tribulations that have gone on in the past two years. But um, having a support system like that, I definitely don't take that for granted because it wouldn't, would not have been possible without them. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've got solid product. You're getting some good market feedback. You're selling out a product every single week, even though you didn't know what you were doing. Although it sounds like you kind of, you, you were definitely on the right track if you were selling out every week. So then what happened from there? What, what was the next evolution of your business? Right. So then at that point, you know, 2018 was over. I was looking at it going back to that original thought that I had that there was a supply and demand problem with the crickets. I was running into that same problem of I didn't have enough crickets to keep up with, you know, the demand I was seeing in the market. So how do I raise more crickets? You know, what do I do? My dad kind of wants a shop back at this point too. So what can I build as my own facility? even though I'm still only a year in, I'm not entirely certain what I want the setup to look like. So I end up, um, my boyfriend actually came up with the idea, but he had to pitch it to me about three times before I got on board, uh, which he would say is totally normal for something, some idea he has and <laughs> quick to shoot it down, but I sometimes come around. And uh, so he had the idea of why not use a mobile home, like an old mobile home, because, you know, there's, if it's a mobile structure, you have a lot of flexibility uh, rather than putting down the foundation for a building and then figuring out six months later that, you know, it just didn't cut it in terms of dimensions, all of that. It's, it's a lower risk, lower cost way to, to expand. And, you know, there's a lot of junker mobile homes that sit around. And then what do you do with them? You toss them in the landfill. Mm -hmm. So here's a good use for one. So uh, at that point, ended up tracking down a company that moves mobile homes because I, I didn't have one yet, but I figured I should probably go figure out how to move one if I could find one. And the guy who owns it said, oh, well, I have one sitting in the back if you want it. And I was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> um, so I found my mobile home and uh, had the guy drag it to my parents' front yard. Again, it's one of those things. They just, they love me. Um, and uh, so he dropped it in the front yard. We stripped it down to the frame, uh, basically to the chassis. The frame was still good. The frame was still solid. And then uh, basically built a Morton building on wheels on top, which I call my Cricket Castle. We looked at, you know, just spray foam insulating the existing structure, but with the amount of windows and the, the cost of spray foam, that stuff is really expensive. In order to get the R values and the insulation that we really wanted, um, it just made more sense to just kind of start over and use the base and, and build on top the way we wanted it. So uh, that Cricket Castle was done end of April. I think. So that took my production space, I would say, can, you know, generously that I was in about 150 square feet before then. So that brought it up to about 600 square feet. So it was a pretty big expansion. Um, took me probably six months to get things filled out, to get things figured out, because even though, you know, I'd been at my other spaces for over a year and I'd figured that out pretty well, you would think things would go one to one from here to there. Of course they never do, you know, just like any other agriculture, you have all these great plans. And then when you actually get into it, it never, never quite right. pans out the way you wanted it to, which is okay. Um, so yeah, it took me a little longer to get that filled out. Then I 
anticipated. But even with that expanded production, I still spent the month of August last farmer's market season, so this past fall, sold out with a couple, because I, I took on a couple bigger events, took on some night markets, I did the Des Moines farmer's market, so I still wasn't able to keep up with demand, so at that point then I had to make a decision, and I had already started the seeds of the, the next expansion plan, uh, I had already started back when we were building the Cricket Castle, because I had a lot of people interested in raising crickets for me, and I said, you know, down the road, yeah, maybe we'll look at it, I, I just don't know what that's going to look like quite yet. In Mar or in August, when I sold out again, I said, all right, it's go time. Whoever wants to raise crickets, you know, hop on, let's do this, and we'll see what happens. So at that point, I decided to, to look at the expansion through a contract grower model, just like the poultry, just like the swine. That's very common here in Iowa. Same sort of concept. Uh, so that was that was the next step, which was was pretty exciting so yeah so you've got your cricket castle you now are talking to your expansion plan which are your contract growers so now you've got bigger production which would mean bigger production on the food side so then how have you handled producing more product because I'm assuming that your mother has now kicked you out of her kitchen as well probably a few too many crickets may have gotten loose in her house I would imagine no, no, honestly, we only we only had a live cricket in the house problem once, and that was because, so I, I put them in the freezer to kill them, and uh, one day I was impatient because I needed, I needed to have crickets the next day because it takes a long time to dry them out, and at the time I was doing them in the oven, and so they, I put them in the freezer like maybe two hours before, got them out of the freezer, spread them out on the tray, put them in the oven, you know, the oven was warm. As they started heating up, I saw them start jumping around, and I was going, that's not good. <laughs> so I turned the heat up really higher, really high, so that they would they would make it quick. And then since then, I make sure that I freeze them for longer so that we don't have that same thing occur. That was the only time that we had the live cricket incident in the kitchen. Oh, um, my gosh. Yeah, only had to learn that lesson once. But, yeah, no, thank you for reminding me because as all of that other expansion of the, the crickets is going on, um, I also, eat for a food business, to get out of the farmer's markets and, and legally be able to sell online and in grocery stores and things like that where you start to actually move some real volume and have a real viable business, you have to have a food processing license. You have to be licensed by the state of Iowa, you know, registered with the FDA, all of that kind of stuff. So that would require a specific facility, a commercial kitchen, um, things like that. So I had been, you know, for the last year trying to figure out, was I going to go rent a commercial kitchen? Could I use, you know, like a community church that's not being used all the time? What do I need? Eventually, I started looking for buildings in small towns to purchase either an already existing kitchen like a restaurant that went out of business or you know a building that could be just renovated into something and so I started that search in the spring as my cricket castle was being built in and built out because I knew I was going to have more volume of crickets thought you know this makes sense uh, ended up finding a building in the small town of Collins Iowa which is about half an hour from my crickets town of 500 people and um i went the ames chamber of commerce has a, a an outreach arm that works with all the smaller communities in story county and so one of the guys who worked for that department hooked me up with uh the woman who was selling that building on main street and um you know i went and looked at it and i was kind of on the fence i was like it's kind of far away i'd like something closer and then the next weekend at the farmer's market, the mayor of that town showed up at my farmer's market booth and said, we want you in Collins. And I said, okay, I guess I'll go take another look. <laughs> and so um, went back down, took another look, talked to, you know, talked to the mayor, talked to some of the council members and um, ended up purchasing that building the end of June. Uh, but so originally that building was built as a hair salon and then it was turned into a funeral home and then it was part of the wellness center and then it was a photography studio so it was obviously going to take quite a bit of work to turn it into a kitchen um, so we did that during July and August 
and it was basically up and running and functional and all of that in August, which is right when I ran into my selling out of crickets problem as well. Um, so that gave me a little bit more time to do my paperwork to get to processing and all of that stuff, the food processing license, all of that submitted, um, had that submitted by the beginning of October and then was fully licensed as a food processor by the state of Iowa as of the day before Thanksgiving last year, which then meant, you know, I could sell online, I can sell in grocery stores, all of that stuff. Um, so I launched my online store in December and here we are, you know, middle of February. Since launching that in December, I have shipped crickets to 29 states. Wow. Kind of blows my mind. Yeah. So what, what in your opinion is the draw to the, you know, the, the cricket protein or an alternate protein? What, what are you finding from customers? Is the, is it novelty? Is there like, what is the, what is the consumer draw to that? You know, there's a combination of a lot of different things that I think are at play right now. Um, yes, there's certainly a novelty piece to it. I would be remiss if I didn't say that there's a lot of drive coming from that novelty piece. But insect protein, the market in general, is just a growing market. You know, it falls under that alternative protein umbrella. So think, you know, the Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burgers, all of that. It's technically lumped into that same alternative protein, although it is an animal protein. Um, it's one of those overlooked things. People don't typically draw the line of animals at insects, but, you know, three out of every four animal species is actually an insect on this earth. So they're a very abundant animal, animal source of protein. But so they fall under that umbrella. And um, as of 2018, it was a $406 million market worldwide. Uh, the 2019 preliminary numbers said it was just below a billion. Um, and that is projected to be 7.9 billion by 2030. Wow. So yeah, so there's expected to be a lot of growth. You know, 80% of the world's countries practice entomophagy, eating of insects in some form or another. You know, our, our neighbors just to the south in Mexico eat over 500 different species of insects. It's very common elsewhere in the world. It's really just us in Canada and much of Western Europe that don't have it as part of their culture. So other parts of the world, it, it's not a hard sell. Um, and honestly, it's getting to be an easier sell here in the West. Partly, you know, there's been a lot of press around it. There, there are people who are looking for alternative protein sources. Maybe they're intolerant of dairy, so common sort of like whey protein and that kind of thing. Um, you know, maybe they have reactions to different kinds of proteins that this is a, a, another good alternative. There's lots of different pieces to it. There is a, you know, a, a sustainability aspect to it too, because I, I can raise 2 million crickets every 45 to 54 days in 650 square feet, you know, whereas you're looking at feeding out a cow for two years, your, you know, hog turns in 240 days or whatever it is. Right. Um, when you start looking at just that shrunken timeline, it's obvious that your resource intake is going to be lower. It just makes sense. So there's that piece as well. It's very confusing for the vegan and vegetarian community because again, where you draw that line of animal, not abundantly clear. Um, so I tend to just stay out of that argument and provide them with information and allow them to make their choice. But it, it's led to some interesting conversations. But yeah, so there's there's many different appeals. And again, you know, it's a it's high protein. So it's 70% protein by weight, more iron than spinach, more calcium than milk, has omega-6s and omega-3s. And again, it, it is a complete protein. So it has all nine essential amino acids in one tiny little package. Wow. Wow. So, you know, as you tell the story, it just seems like, oh, Shelby just went from one thing to the next thing, had a couple of cricket incidences. Sounds like this was pretty easy. But what was what has been your biggest challenge? Because you're obviously moving into, you know, somewhat of a new industry. You know, obviously we're not finding lots of coaches and mentors of people who have gone before you who were willing to talk to you about it. You basically had to pull information together. But what would you say out of all of that has been some of your biggest challenges, things you've had to overcome to get to the point you are today? Yeah, um, there's 
oh, the list is long in terms of, of overcoming challenges. I suppose I've told that story so many times. Yeah, it does seem all very rosy and everything's fine, no big deal. Um, you miss the part where I've killed millions of baby crickets on accident because I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know I had a problem, didn't figure it out until multiple days too late. Uh, they say you aren't a real cricket farmer until you've killed at least 100,000. So I ticked that box really early. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of things like that, though, from just, you know, I come from a finance background. I don't come from an entomology background. I don't, I mean, I, I come from a farming background in so much as I grew up on a farm. Not that I really had interest in it. We didn't have animals. Like, I had cats and kittens and, you know, and dogs, but animal husbandry, which is what this is on a micro scale, that wasn't my wheelhouse. Anyone that I would talk to in an entomology department, you know, say here at Iowa State, they're raising insects on a much smaller scale. So while they could help me with some of the basics of understanding some of the, you know, how much food do they need? How much water do they need? You know, you need to make sure you keep these eggs moist, otherwise they won't hatch. They could help me with some of those basic questions, but as you start to scale those processes, and try to, you know, have your population densities up and all of those kind of things. Those are questions they can't answer. I'm on my own for that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, just having to go through all of that and really go through the growing pains of figuring out, all right, first of all, how do you raise the crickets? Great. So now you figured that out. So how do you do that on a bigger scale? Awesome. Are you now comfortable enough with it that you feel like you could teach somebody how to do it? Uh, that was a really big step for me. And even at this point now, continue. So I currently have two growers with crickets on board. Third one comes on in the next 10 days. And then I have two more that will come on in the next probably four to eight weeks. Uh, so it's one thing when it's just me on this venture and me risking it, risking capital, risking time, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. Now I have five other families and I have the weight of those five families on my shoulders. So that's one thing that I've definitely, as of late, as of the last couple of months, I definitely feel that pressure of like, oh, it's not just you anymore. Like, you know, you have, you have these other five people that believe in you enough that they are like, yes, we are all in. We wanna do this with you. We believe in what you're doing. So that's been an interesting thing that has really come up with me. You know, they say imposter syndrome is very much a thing. Uh, I've been going through that lately, I suppose. Yeah. So, you know, tell me what you love about this business. Because you, you've proclaimed several times that you are not a farmer, don't want to be a farmer, was never interested. And now, you know, you kind of are a farmer a little bit. Yes. But tell me what about this business are, is so engaging and exciting for you because I can tell you you're really excited about it so what about it are you loving yeah well I am that was is my dad actually said that to me maybe three weeks ago he said have you figured out you're a farmer yet I said yes I know <laughs> and I don't say that you know I'm not that's that's not in a negative way that I say I'm a farmer I'm actually very I'm proud of that you know there's less than two percent of the U.S. proclaims himself a farmer we are we are a small, um, small but mighty group, I'd like to think. And so what excites me about the business? I think just business in general, just being able to build something from the ground up. You know, I think that was part of my dissatisfaction in the finance industry. It was all so well established and I felt very, I would say very constricted from a creativity standpoint. It felt very political and bureaucratic and all of the things, you know, that you might find in, in corporate America that don't get me wrong. There's, there's corporate America has its, has its advantages. There's benefits, all of that kind of stuff. But that structure just didn't fit me and my personality type very well. So I think the, the ability to be so dynamic and, and do so many different things. And honestly, like learning every day. I still remember my senior year of college having a conversation with one of my friends who had graduated two years earlier and is working in an accounting firm. And he looked at me and he said, you guys don't know how lucky you are because you still get to learn new things every day. 
And like, I didn't realize what he was talking about until I got into work and really got into the routine. And I was like, oh, I see. Like, yeah, there's room to move up in certain things, but ultimately, you know, you get pigeonholed into one thing and then you become that. So I've never been one that likes to be put in boxes, I suppose. And so this allows me to be in multiple different boxes all at once, which has been pretty cool. Yeah. So, you know, tell me a little bit too about, you know, where you see your business going from here, because you, you kind of established a base, you're getting, it sounds like you're, you probably got a fairly steady client base at this time where you're getting people that are repeat buying. You've got contract growers that are now helping you with your production piece. So what's next in terms of your expansion plans? Because I'm sure there's shipping and there's product and there's marketing and there's a lot of different things that I'm sure are happening inside your business at this point. So how, where do you see yourself going from here? Yeah. So the next big step for me is to really start to go after the grocery stores and and the wholesale contracts. Um, I've had some initial conversations and I've actually gotten some really good feedback. I got my first uh, rejection, if you will, from, from a grocery store, but it was really, really valuable because what that manager said to me was something that the first grocery store who did agree to put it on their shelves because I actually had customers from farmers markets walking in their door and asking if, if they had my product. So that was, you know, that helped, that made it really easy. This other store did not have that. Both stores said, we don't know where to put you on the shelf, which was something that I had not thought about. I'm not in the grocery business. I really don't know a whole lot about the food business other than I eat three times a day kind of deal. So there's a lot of these nuances that I'm still learning from the marketing side, from just the food, having that finished product. If you want to look at the manufacturing side, I am in my infancy in terms of food manufacturing and tricks and and all of that kind of stuff, the food safety regulations, the food safety, everything that that entails, it's massive, it's huge. And as I grow, I'm hoping to be able to bring some people on my team, either in a consulting role or something like that, that are clued in on that to help speed that learning curve up. So there's many, a lot of growth in the next year is definitely going to happen as this, this production scales up. because. Believe it or not, obviously it takes a lot of crickets to to really be able to have a lot of volume to do these wholesale contracts. But then I also want to do a lot of events. Events have been very successful for me um, because, you know, most people have never tried a cricket and most people are not just going to walk up to the shelf, see a cricket and be like, oh, I'm going to buy that. There's a little bit of an education curve that needs to happen there. Sampling is always very key. I have these stickers that say I ate a cricket and if you try a sample you get a sticker uh, it's a badge of honor so there's for me my food business has to be high touch so it's figuring out you know what events do I want to be at like rag Bry, you know ride Iowa these things where you can do beers bugs and bikes kind of deal like all sorts of things like that where I can get those eyeballs on my product get them to try their first cricket so they'll be more likely to be repeat buyers. So that'll be like the first year. And then as we go forward, figuring out how much more we need to expand, you know, getting in stores outside of Iowa, eventually, ultimately, I'd love to get the attention of like a big food company enough that they're like, hey, we should probably buy you because, you know, you have the whole infrastructure of the crickets being raised and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that hopefully at that point I've solved the supply problem for a bigger food company. Cause that's the only way that they're ever going to get interested is if you solve the supply piece, because then yeah. they can develop all of their own products and do all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Just give the listeners a little bit of scope because, you know, we've been talking about, you know, 2 million crickets and just talk about how many crickets does it take to produce something? So just give the listeners a little bit of scope about that. So it's between three and 5,000 crickets and a pound of dry crickets. So a pound of dry, dry cricket powder, anything like that, it's three to 5,000. So already you start doing that math, you know, a million, it's quite a few, but it's not going to get you very far. 
as you start looking at more of these mass produced foods and that kind of stuff, like the, the kind of volume they do just boggles your mind. You know, if I back that out into crickets, it's a scary number. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, like I said, in any, any, any volume or anything like that, it, it takes quite a bit. So I typically sell them in um, half ounce bags of roasted crickets. There's about 90 to a hundred crickets in a bag, you know, again, start doing that math and you go through a lot of crickets really fast. So it, there's still plenty of room for growth. I will probably cap my number of growers at 10 for this year, just to see where that 10 gets us and then start having those conversations, uh, put a list together. Cause at this point, you know, that young farmer conference was the best audience I could have been in front of. Cause those are young farmers always looking for, you know, diversification opportunities. So that was, that's been great. And I've picked up two, possibly four new growers from that. So, yeah. So, so just, just what, what does it take to be a grower for you? What, what do you have to have to be qualified? Yeah. Um, space and a willingness to learn. I, I get a lot of people that say, oh, I could do this in my basement. I'm like, you could, but I definitely would not. You wouldn't raise a cow in your basement. So I would not recommend doing that either unless you want your significant other to leave you which is fine so you need space some sort of space i usually my growers start between 500 and a thousand square feet you have to go through my i do a two-day cricket rearing course that they have to go through so i teach them how to raise crickets you know we go through the basics of hatching and harvesting uh, even from construction of the bins, um, stacking egg flats, which sounds like it wouldn't be very hard, but it is probably one of the more frustrating things people have to learn. So all of those things, I just run them through the basics. They get a 40-page a cricket rearing manual with supporting YouTube videos for everything that I do. Um, what I do, I always tell them what I do is not gospel. Um, if you find a better way to make a mouse trap, where I'm good with that. So there's lots of, there's room for creativity in that as well. And then um, we just put the contract in place and they agree to agree to sell me all their crickets that they raise. I provide all the feed, so that feed bill is not on them. Um, you know, that's one of my biggest quality control is my feed, because that will directly affect, uh, directly affect the taste of the crickets. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so then, so how many products do you have in your lineup now? So now I have um, energy bars. So I have three flavors of energy bars, six flavors of roasted crickets, and then three different sizes of the 100% cricket powder. So those, those three are all available on my website. Once I get some of my um, paperwork in place, I suppose, I will start experimenting with more flavors of the energy bars. But for now, I got to got to stay on the lower end of flavors until I get a handle on on all of my processing facility and and all the tracking and all yeah stuff. so how like in a protein bar how many grams of protein are you consuming <laughs> so it depends on the flavor but uh between 10 and 12 grams I believe off the top of my head I'm pretty sure it's between 10 and 12 grams in a in a bar and then in the half ounce of roasted crickets, there's eight grams protein in a bag. So 14 total grams of weight and eight of those grams are protein. So wow. pretty high. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, where have you, you know, you obviously haven't been able to find some support, but there was, there, there's been so much learning. So where did you get all your information? Did, were you able to partner with a group or has this just been a hundred percent? You just went out and found what you needed to put all of this together? Um, it's been a combination of some things. There, I mean, there are certainly other, you know, companies that exist that are doing this, but because this, inter this uh, industry is in such infancy, tends to be not super open in terms of information sharing, which I suppose is understandable, like I get that. So majority of the initial gu guidance and all of that, it wasn't there for me. It was a lot of trial and error. Luckily, you know, crickets, the life cycle is about 45 to 54 days. So very short, you can experiment a lot. And if something totally screws up, 
you just wait another six weeks and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, each female lays between five and 10 eggs per day. So it was never a matter of not having babies. You had plenty of them. Uh, it was just keeping them alive, which got to experiment with that a lot too. So there were a lot of things that way. Most of it was trial and error. I obviously took some tips, YouTube. There's a lot of people who own reptiles, who they were raising their crickets to feed to their reptiles because they didn't want to buy them from the pet store because they're very expensive. Um, so there was a little bit of guidance there. They had some tricks and tips and some of those. But majority of it, it's kind of like the dark ages. You just kind of had to figure it out. And honestly, though, I think it, it for me, it was better that way. I just learned better. I was more confident in what I was doing because I went through that. And like, mm -hmm. I know if somebody comes to me and, and gives me an idea on something, I've probably tried it. And so I can tell you why that's not going to work, but try it anyways. Do you believe me? But you know, I don't think that's going to work. So I think going through it the way I did, there, there were easier ways for me to scale my food business. I could have gone and gotten crickets from other suppliers imported them from Canada, imported them from Southeast Asia. But ultimately that wasn't, that didn't solve the problem of having a shortage of crickets. You know, many of the companies in the U.S. rely on a sole supplier out of Canada. That to me, as with my finance background and, and just felt like general common sense through so many red, red flags from a risk perspective. Like that is the main um, crucial ingredient in your products and you are relying on a single source to provide you all of that you better hope a they stay in business and b you stay on their good side you know yeah. otherwise you, you can run in, into all sorts of problems so I didn't ever want to be at the mercy of just the one person either so I went the harder route and decided to raise my own. <laughs> yeah. So you obviously you know you've had some amazing support from you know your boyfriend from your parents um, but a lot of people are probably sitting there going, well, you know, are you working another job? Like, how are you funding all of this? Like, how did you get all of this put together? How did you buy a building? Like, people are like, okay, this is just mind boggling because this is a lot of spinning plates for you. Yeah, no, and it definitely is. I will say I was very lucky to have all of my college and master's education paid for through basketball, which meant I didn't have any student debt coming out of college. My boyfriend played football in college, but he played Division Three, so he does have student debt. So he and I get to have this conversation, you know, very in the face of, like, it, it's just such an advantage. Like, I'm not, you know, I wasn't strapped down with that. And then I went into a finance career over in Ireland. You know, finance does pay well. So I, by the time I came back to the U.S., I had some decent savings. And then, um, again, parental support. I live in my parents' basement right now. You know, it just is what it is. It's one of those things. It's the price of entrepreneurship. I couldn't do this if I didn't do that. Yeah. Um, hopefully, you know, next 12 months that we can gradually move out of that. But, um, you know, it's just one of those things that they, they had the space. They were willing to, they're willing to let me, let me sleep downstairs until I get these things moving. So their support has been has been absolutely critical so yeah and I know and just recently you participated in the grow your future award competition with Iowa Farm Bureau so talk a little bit about what that was and you know that whole vetting process because that is how I, I found out about you and I found that whole thing to be fascinating I was so excited to see that award process you know in play so talk a little bit about that Right. So I originally found out about that competition. I think it was in the Farm Bureau spokesman that my dad had been reading. And um, I came came home from something and there was a little newspaper clipping sticking there. And my dad said, you need to look at that. You might be really interested in it. And it was just they were looking for applicants for the Grow Your Future. This would have been last summer. And so the first step was we had to submit a video covering, you know, these five different things, submit a, a video, and that would go to a panel of judges, and those judges would select top 10, and we'd find out who was in the top 10. And then if you were in the top 10, there would be a public voting portion on Facebook to figure out who was in the top six. 
So that public voting portion, I made the top 10, obviously. And then, because uh, otherwise, I don't think we would have ever met. And then, um, so made the top 10. The voting portion was in December and made the top six for that. And then, so then the top six, we got to pitch at the Young Farmer Conference back end of January, beginning January. of February. Yep. And so that was how we got to do get up on stage in front of it was probably 600 people at that it was, point between it was attendees. 600 people at that conference. Yes. It was very yes. large. It was very well attended. Right. So um, got to get up on stage in front of those 600 people at, at lunch and uh, give a five minute pitch about our about our business. And then I don't know if you did you say for that whole competition? I did, yeah. Yeah, so then, you know, it opened up for a, a little bit of audience voting there for about 10 minutes. And then, so there was an audience voting portion and a judge's portion, and um, they announced the winners at, at dinner, and I was lucky enough to be selected as as the winner. So that was, yeah, so that was congratulations. Cool. Yeah, that's Thank really you. amazing. Thank so, you. So I have two questions left for you. Number one, <laughs> has there ever been a time during this journey that you're like, I was right. I'm not a farmer. Forget these crickets. I am done with this. Have, have, did you ever hit a point where you thought it maybe it was time to hang it up? Um, I don't know if I ever was like, yes, I should hang it up. Um, I think I definitely had times where I was hesitant, questioning whether what I had thought to be true at the beginning was actually true. Uh, whether I had any business trying to do what I was doing. But, you know, at the end of the day, when I started really thinking about it, you know, looking around competition, where everybody else was at, you know, the comparison, comparison is the thief of joy or whatever that saying is. But I eventually talked myself off the ledge by saying, you know, if not you, who's going to go do it? You know, who's going to turn this market into something that's actually worth talking about? Why can't it be you? You know, what, what are they doing that makes you think that they deserve to, to do that any more than you do? So I wouldn't say that I've ever had any, nope, let's hang it up. I'm done with the crickets. Let's go move on and do something. I've definitely had moments where I'm like, hmm, Maybe I should go at least like get a part-time job or something like something to have, you know, not just the cash flowing out the door as I try to expand. So there's definitely been those moments. And like I said, I suffer from imposter syndrome, just like anybody else says, as they're building a business or gaining notoriety in something. Um, there's many times where, you know, somebody will, portray me as the cricket expert or something and I kind of go no 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 <laughs> no no I am not that <laughs> I am not that I know a few things probably enough to be dangerous but there's still so much for me to learn so you know I I would say that's it's almost a daily occurrence of having some sort of okay so am I doing the right thing you know but I think I think that fear is what sort of propels you forward so I think there's great value in that as long as it doesn't, doesn't tie you down, mm -hmm. which I haven't thus far. I've not let it do, but um, there's definitely been pressures as I've grown. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So last big question. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you've been on this journey, you've taken, you, you came up with an idea, you got that idea out into the world and now you're, you're really getting some traction with that. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners, just by the nature of the show, are sitting there with at least one great idea and maybe are a little hesitant or maybe not sure how to start. What would be your advice as an entrepreneur to, you know, people who might be listening? What would you say, you know, top tip, first couple of steps, what would you say to them if they're sitting there going, wow, I wish I could do something like that? So kind of goes back to my last answer of you know if not if not you who else is going to do that and what makes you think that you know they're any more qualified like it, it, i have a bunch of finance degrees like i again i'm not i'm from a farming background but not really i didn't really have any business teaching myself how to raise crickets and become the quote unquote 
cricket expert. Um, it's just that I, I started, I went for it. I took a first step. Now, my first step might look very different than someone else's. Like, I'm not out here telling you, you have this great idea. You already have a stable job and you have a family and all of that stuff. I'm not telling you, go quit your job and take your first step towards your dream. That's not what I'm saying. There's other steps that you can take. You know, we, we only get one time around on this whole thing. So I would be much more uncomfortable if I got to the end of all of this life and I didn't try it than, you know, if I tried and failed and tried and failed and everybody thought I was crazy because I'm trying to get people to eat bugs. You know what? So what? It's, it's, um, don't worry what people think about you because they don't think about you. And I think that fear of like worrying whatever, what, you know, what's everybody going to think, just forget that. They got enough problem. Everybody else has enough problems to worry about. They're in their own head. Mm -hmm. Like, don't worry about people think about you because they don't think about you. Yeah. I know when you, when you started, you said you just ordered crickets, but did you, did you do any kind of business planning? Did you put some pen to paper and figure out what this was going to look like? Or did you just leap in and then start putting it together from there? Combination of both. Uh, I have this theory about entrepreneurship, and I think that it is rather pervasive in my family, if I'm honest, so I didn't have a choice but to think like this. There is a certain element of entrepreneurship of making uh, promises or making plans or claims and then figuring out how to make it happen. There's just an element of that, that if you're going to grow and you're going to it, there is such a thing as paralysis by analysis. So like I could have sat in my spreadsheets and done, you know, analyzed over and over again, all of these things, but I didn't, I decided, you know, let me try this. And if it keeps going, we'll see. Um, don't worry. Since then I've put plenty of pens to plenty of papers um, and figured <laughs> things out. But at the beginning, that was just the way it had to start is it had to, I had to start um, because if I sat there and I thought about it for too long, I'd probably talk myself out of it. Um, I think that was my main advantage is I, I didn't sit there yeah. and think about it too long. I was like, well, we'll figure this out. So, yeah. uh, I know that's not everybody's situation. And again, like, like I said, I am, I am not, uh, naive to the fact of, of my situation with the support I have around me with the lack of student debt, with all of that stuff that put me in a prime position to be able to, to, you know, go after something like this. And, and I know that's not everyone's situation, but there's always something you can do. There's always, you know, always a step you can take. So I'd say just take a step. Maybe not as, maybe not the big scary step that you're worried about yet, but just a small step. That's awesome. Okay. So I know that everybody that's listening to this now wants to order crickets. I know they do. I know. So I hope you are stocked up. So if people want to connect with you or order product or just find out more about what you're doing, tell everybody how they could connect with you. Yes. So I would say on the socials, the best way to connect with me is on Instagram. And my handle for that is at Jim, G-Y-M underscore N underscore E-A-T underscore crickets. So Jiminy crickets. Um, you can also search me on Facebook. I have a Facebook page as well. Uh, I'm not tend to not be as active on there. And then if you do want to order product, you can just visit my website at www.jimineatcrickets, all one word, no spaces, no hyphens.com. And, um, and yeah, there's a little shop button. And, and as long as you're in the U.S., they can be shipped to your door. And then the other place that you might be able to find me, depending on the week, is I'm actually an admin on the Women in Ag Instagram um, some of your listeners might be followers of that. So as part of my admin duties, I do, I take over that account for one week a month. Um, so the, that has just women across all sorts of different ag that we do features, we do takeovers. Um, but you get a little peek into, into what's going on in my world on the weeks that I'm, I'm the admin. So Excellent. Excellent. So for everybody who's listening, I know, you know, podcasts, it's a great thing to listen to a podcast when you're driving. So don't try to, you know, write down that while you're driving or if you're in a tractor, just when you get a second, just click on the show episode. We will have a full 
um, transcript of our conversation today along with all of Shelby's contact information. So there'll be links there for you. So don't, don't get crazy trying to write this all down while you're driving. And Shelby is going to be excited to connect with you. And Shelby, thank you so much for sharing your story. I am just fascinated about this. I, I, I'm just so excited for your success. And I mean, who would have thought that right here in Iowa, we've added a major new protein source. <laughs> so that is amazing. And I just wish you nothing but continued success. Congratulations on all you've achieved so far. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. This is Rena Striggle, and you have been listening to Ag Inspo, the podcast. Please visit my website at tomorrowiscoming.com and find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you haven't yet, please go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another inspirational episode where you will hear from another amazing entrepreneur who has had the courage to break through and bring an idea to life.